Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Best of UNICEF Research and Evaluation Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Emanuela Bianchera. I am focal point for the Best of UNICEF Research Exercise at the Office of Research in Accenti, and today I will be hosting your webinar. Uh, today we present one of the winning research pieces of 2020, uh, the study at a crossroads unaccompanied and separated children in their transition to adulthood in Italy. The study has been a collaboration between UNICEF, UNHCR, IOM and the ISMU Foundation in Italy. I'm very pleased to introduce today's winners uh, for this research and the speakers. Uh, Sara Martelli. Sara is a youth and adolescent development specialist for migrant and refugee response at the UNICEF Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia. Giuseppe Lococo, Protection Associate, uh, UNHCR representation for Italy, the Holy See and San Marino. Laura Bartolini, researcher, IOM Coordination Office for the Mediterranean, and Laura is also focal point for the Displacement Tracking Matrix Initiative. And finally, Emanuela Bonini, researcher at the ISMU Foundation for Initiatives and Studies on Multi-Ethnicity. Co-hosting with me today are Kerry Albright, Chiefs of the Research Facilitation and Knowledge Management Unit at the Office of Research, and Josiah Kaplan, Child Protection Specialist, Focal Point for Migration Research at Innocenti. Just for your information, the webinar will be divided into two parts. During the first half an hour, we will present the results from the study and award the winners. In the second part of the webinar, Josiah Kaplan will hold the panel discussion where you will have the opportunity to interact with the speakers by posting your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, before we start with the main webinar, we would like to show you a short video to give you a taster of the findings and uh, of the impact of this research. Uh, can I kindly ask my colleague Cristina Pizzolato to launch the video? Between 2014 and 2018, around 70,000 unaccompanied and separated children reached Italy via the central Mediterranean route. Of these, 90% were between 15 and 17 years of age. And since then, around 60,000 have turned 18. This research is the outcome of a joint effort of the three UN agencies who are present in Italy in support to migrant and refugee children and adolescents. We pooled our resources and we pooled our perspectives in order to gain a better understanding to build the evidence around the transition that these children and adolescents face when they reach Italy. We wanted to inform policy and decision making and we wanted to maximize our coordinated efforts. The research is based on the concept of triple transition from adolescence to adulthood, from country of origin to the new social cultural space, and through the trauma that many unaccompanied migrant children carry with them after a long journey. Such an approach revealed the shortcomings of age-based boundaries and of long waiting times to obtain the documentation and to begin with a social inclusion path. Specialized staff is needed to cover for the mental and physical health needs of those escaping exploitation, and also to offer education, employment, and housing solutions that can guide these young adults towards independence. A number of uh, recommendations for uh, national and uh, European institutions were devised. Those recommendations include the adoption of policies and services, uh, particularly addressing the specific needs of uh, children and young adults, a full compliance with the national legislation on child protection, which is uh, very advanced, the promotion of uh, family and community-based uh, alternative care, and uh, uh, last but not least, participation. Thank you very much. I now invite Carrie Albright to award the winners. Thank you. So for the past eight years, the Office of Research in Nocenti has invited UNICEF colleagues around the world, including country offices, regional offices, national committees and headquarters to submit their best and most recent examples of quality research for children to an annual competition. The aim is to promote research best practices to identify where they may be scaled up and to award quality studies with a high potential for impact on policies and programs that benefit children. 
In 2020, UNICEF Innocenti and UNICEF's Evaluation Office joined forces to produce a single report, The Best of UNICEF Research and Evaluation 2020, which collected quality research and evaluations from two ongoing UNICEF exercises, The Best of UNICEF Research and Most Influential Evaluations. In the current global political climate, evidence, facts, and objective assessment are needed more than ever to help enhance the rights and well being of the world's children and to ensure that we achieve maximum value for money for children with every dollar spent. Researching the changing world around us and evaluating progress towards a better world are two sides of the same coin, both critical to reimagining the future. The Ball webinars aim to jointly promote the 2020 winners and to enhance the visibility and uptake of their work, both within UNICEF and externally. The three 2020 research winners were all deemed outstanding in terms of highlighting structural discrimination and violence against children and adopting a rights-based approach whilst giving voice to children and communities. They were also exemplary in engaging local institutions in the research allowing for ownership and policy and program impact. Today, as you heard from Emanuela, we award and feature the winning research at a crossroads, unaccompanied and separated children in their transition to adulthood in Italy. This research was commissioned by UNICEF, UNHCR and IOM in collaboration with ISMU and presents an overview of trends and possible pathways to adult life for this group of children in Italy. Rather than applying a simplistic age threshold, the research introduces the concept of triple transition, the transition from adolescence to adulthood, the dislocating transition of migration, and the transition to overcoming traumas experienced during or after the journey. Recognizing children's right to participate in decisions affecting them and taking care to protect their best interests, the study engaged former unaccompanied and separated children in the role of interviewers. This participative approach led to a comprehensive understanding of the multiplicity of situations, subjective difficulties, structural bottlenecks, and support factors that determine their transition to adulthood. The mixed methods research using qualitative and quantitative approaches further identified best practices in protection, care, and social inclusion that could be supported by United Nations agencies, Italian and European institutions, and civil society. In their feedback, reviewers particularly commended this piece of research for its original topic, its innovative and comprehensive conceptualization, and the rigor with which the researchers addressed the research questions. They also commented on the report's engaging writing, its very well articulated and actionable policy recommendations, and the excellent application of ethical standards. It was also ranked highly on potential for impact as reviewers saw it as a welcome and topical addition to the evidence base on the current politics of international migration, including for children. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, it was felt to provide an excellent example of how to enhance and amplify children's voices in a participatory and youth-led manner whilst recognizing children's best interests and their right to express their opinions on decisions that affect them personally. It therefore gives me great pleasure to be able to virtually hand over this award certificate to members of the research team. So to Sarah Martelli, Emanuele Bonini, Giuseppe Lecocco, Laura Bartolini and Claudio Laforte. Claudia Laforte. And I'd like to uh, hand over to Sarah Martelli to uh, respond on behalf of uh, the whole research team. And we will put your research certificates, your award certificates uh, in the post. They won't just be virtual. So thank you very much. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. Really many thanks to Innocenti in the Evaluation Office for this recognition. I'm, I'm really honored to receive it on behalf of the Migrant and Refugee Response Team of the UNICEF Europe and Central Asia Regional Office, uh, posted here in Italy, uh, UNHCR and IOM colleagues, and uh, ISMU Foundation, our research partner. When we embarked on, on this uh, research piece, little did we know we would go this far. Uh, it has been an extremely enriching experience, not without its challenges. 
um, but it has paid off. And we're extremely um, uh, proud and, and very re-energized uh, to continue the evidence building, but also the advocacy and the program work in support to unaccompanied children and young migrants and refugees. So thank you once again on behalf of us all. Congratulations again, Sarah and team. Uh, now I hand it over again to Sarah and Emanuela to give a short presentation about their research. And for the people at home, if you have any questions, you can start submitting this in the Q&A box. Over to Sarah. From the beginning, sorry. Um, until the slide mm, fixed, um, I want to say good afternoon and just two, just uh, two words. It's a pleasure and an emotion to be here today. Um, on behalf of ISMO Foundation, many thanks. We are very proud of his uh, award, which is a recognition of our, of our mission to contribute in promoting mig migration culture. So moving to the presentation, <clears throat> I want to start with the research questions to define the framework. The next, please. Um, the research intended to analyze the transition to adulthood was in Italy and to provide empirical evidence of factors that facilitate or constrain this transition. The areas which we have examined were impact of, of legal status on the transition to adulthood, the access to education, vocational and on the job training, the access to job market and the risks related to informal labor and exploitation, the access to adequate housing solutions, the role of formal and informal relationships, the relationships with family of origin, of origin and the possibilities of family reunification, the experiences with volunteer guardians and the risk of onward movements. Next, please. Uh, to explore these relevant issues, uh, we involve 185 WASC and former WASC distributed in the three Italian regions. 166 uh, were male and 19 female corresponding to the national distribution of WASP population. 47% of the young involved was around 18 years old. And the more represented nationalities are, as you can see in the slide, Gambia, Egypt, Albania, Guinea, Mali, and Nigeria. Uh, finally, considering their legal status, 48 WASP in had a resident permit for minor, for minor, 17 former WASC benefited of international protection, 48 ha had other forms of national protection, and 22 applied for asylum. You can find other, other details of the sample characteristics in the report. The next, please. to investigate uh, the complexity given by articulated research question and vulnerable target group, we chose a methodological approach based on mixed methods, which enabled us to explore the research field better than an exclusively qualitative or quantitative approach. We used quantitative technique to collect and analyze primary and secondary data concerning demographic characteristic and legal status of WASC and former WASC, and also information about their presence in adult learning centers. In addition, WASC opinions on their education and training pathways were collected through two EU reports on the move foods. As for qualitative technique, we use biographical interviews and focus group involving WASC and former WASC, as well as semi-structured interview with key social and institutional informants. Also, three case studies were implemented for ident identifying good practices. The next, please. To carry out biographical interview and ensuring the protection of the best interests of the WASC, we used a peer research approach 
In fact, peer-to-peer -peer relationships imply a low level of power imbalance, as well as a more comfortable interviewing context through similar experience and emotional proximity between interviewers and interviewees. To the peer-to-peer uh, -peer relationships also facilitate the possibility to build trustful setting for the interviewers. To achieve this condition, we selected 10 former WASC with, girl, with good languages competences, relationship skills, and capability to go deep to go deep into the research field. They received a specific training on methods for conducting interviews. Um, the peer researcher carry out the interviews with a one-to-one -one support to an expert and also receive the permanent support by all of the research team on the difficulties emerging from the interviews. Um, this methodological framework allowed to achieve research expected results, but on this aspect, I leave the floor to Sara Martelli. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Emanuela. Uh, before I start, a quick note of uh, introduction, although it's been mentioned both in, in the video and by, by Manuela, uh, regarding the uh, conceptual framework underpinning the research, that is of the triple transition. Transition of the, this group of children is a transition from adolescence to adulthood with its biological, physical, socio-emotional and cognitive changes that is common to all human beings. And that is occurring at the same time as a transition related to migration. And that, that means the detachment from one's context of origin and the need to build a new life in a different cultural and social environment. And ultimately the transition related to overcoming the trauma experienced during and also after the journey. So with that, we can, we can start. Next. The focus group discussions and biographical interviews that Emanuela referred to earlier revealed that a multiplicity of factors that are interdependent and interrelated. And these factors determine the choices an unaccompanied child makes as he or she transitions to, to adulthood. We'll just look at a couple of these factors in this slide and then zoom into a few, a few of the ones that are here. In terms of legislation legal framework, um, in April 2017, law 47 was approved. It's known as the Legge Zampa. This is one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced legal framework for the recognition of rights and the protection of unaccompanied children in, in Europe. In terms of reception, of course, these are the facilities where unaccompanied children are hosted upon arrival in Italy. And the research revealed that they can play a positive role for this transition but this experience is also strongly influenced by, by the local context. And lastly, relations, um, formal and informal relationships that unaccompanied children establish upon arrival and along their path in Italy, relationships with adults and with peers, and these represent important support for their pathways. Uh, an educator role in the facility, uh, the volunteer guardians as well. If we can move to the next slide, we'll look at some of these factors that facilitate transition a little bit more in detail. In terms of education and training pathways, um, the unaccompanied children in Italy have the right, but also the obligation to learn Italian and complete compulsory schooling in, in Italy. This is a necessary uh, step for their social inclusion in the country. To do so, there's a range of education services from workshops and reception facilities to uh, courses in formal catch-up schools. There are of course some challenges with re in relation to their literacy levels upon arrival, as well as the challenge of building trust and developing relationships with their teachers, with their peers and other adults at school. Then again, the research revealed that often they have the, the advantage of knowing several languages and that's very helpful when, when one is learning a new language, of course. And they're definitely aware of the importance of learning Italian and completing school as a fundamental step in their, path, in their path to inclusion. In terms of vocational training, that can occur simultaneous to tangent language and compulsory schooling if the course is short. If it's a longer course, the child will have obtained the Italian language and compulsory middle school certificate first. I mention this because we'll see later why these sequential steps act, can act as a barrier to the transition, to the transition process. Next. 
Volunteer guardians, uh, volunteer guardians were, the role of the volunteer guardian was established uh, uh, with the 2017 law that I referred to earlier. And this role can be positive and effective when the guardian succeeds in, in guiding an unaccompanied child's interaction with the outside world, including identifying signs of discomfort or calls for help. In reality, much depends on the motivation, the listening skills and the empathy of the guardian and in his or her availability in terms of time and presence in the daily life of the child. One of the shortcomings that uh, came out quite clearly in the research is that the volunteer guardian, uh, although it's regulated by law uh, in 2017, lacks a permanent support mechanism uh, for, for them to be able to fulfill their role uh, to the maximum. Next, in terms of housing, Housing independence is a key milestone in an unaccompanied child's transition. Uh, for the, many of them, it represents the possibility of leaving the rigid rules of the reception system or as they are perceived. Uh, but it also means having a work contract as accompanying documentation to present to the prospective landowner if they're looking to rent an apartment, for example. The research in fact revealed once again that support is a determining factor. And in this regard, Family foster care is among the most positive experiences, and it can continue after a child, a child turns 18. Although, unfortunately, in Italy, its use is still, is still very limited. One of the three case studies, Manuela mentioned three case studies that were documented as part of the research, identified supervised independent living, living as a promising practice. And why is, why is it a promising practice? Because it represents an intermediate or transitional phase towards autonomy. Factors of success in this case include the fact that the apartments are located in different neighborhoods, other than just urban peripheries or disadvantaged areas, which could create a ghetto effect. Um, the limited presence of educators and their role more as mediators rather than supervisors, which is the case in reception facilities. And the establishment of more flexible rules, which naturally generates a sort of an increased sense of responsibility by, by the young guests. Next. Uh, the legal framework and related rights change dramatically when an unaccompanied minor turns 18. I mentioned the uh, law that was approved in 2017, Alige Zampa, and while the rights granted through this law to unaccompanied minors protect their stay, their legal status and their social life in Italy, an 18-year-old can be pushed back, can be expelled, no longer benefits from accommodation through the reception system, and loses the range of rights held by virtue of being a child that is granted by, by that law in 20, approved in 2017. The right to volunteer guardian and to all the procedural guarantees, such as the right to priority examination of their application for legal status in Italy. Next. Uh, just as there are a number of um, multiple factors facilitating unaccompanied children's transition to adulthood, so there are a number of factors that uh, hinder that transition. In terms of legislation, um, the biggest hurdle is the very slow and complex procedures for obtaining documents, which are related to their request for legal status in the country, for, for a request for asylum or, or a residence permit, uh, passports, social security numbers, and so on. And these are real obstacles in the lives of unaccompanied uh, children. Their second, um, that, that slowness, if we want, in terms of the bureaucratic procedures, sheds a little bit of light on another key determining factor that came out very, very strongly during the research. And that is that the very short time that most of these unaccompanied children have because of their age, Manuela gave a, a snapshot of the age breakdown of our sample, but that is reflecting the age breakdown of unaccompanied children arriving in Italy, and around 90% of those are between 16 and 17 years of age. And that means that they have a very, very short window to equip themselves with the knowledge and with all the tools that they need for that, to obtain independence and, and start their process of inclusion in Italian society. I mentioned education and vocational training class as an example. You can imagine they arrive, they need to learn Italian, fulfill, the, obtain their certificate for middle school, and then they can continue with a longer term uh, vocational training. Path. So it becomes very, very tricky to be able to do that in such a short period of time. And then they hit age 18 and they lose all the rights that they 
had in virtue of being a minor. Access to information. Uh, certainly some limitations emerge with respect to, to information and guidance on the opportunities on the, and on the potential pathways that unaccompanied children have. Um, problems with the language with which this information is communicated, the channels through which this is communicated, uh, and also the clarity with which some of the very complex uh, bureaucratic procedures are communicated. We can look at the other factors in a little bit more detail in the following slides. So next, please. In terms of employment paths, of course, these uh, a key, play a key role, uh, particularly when a child turns 18, in the path to independence and transition. And they depend on a number of factors, depending on the legal status, but also, again, on the type of guidance and orientation they receive in the choices that they can make but also in the offer of adequate professional training or even availability of work grants and internships. And again, these paths depend on the support that they receive by an adult figure, a volunteer guardian, an educator, a social worker, and by geographical disparities in the availability of training and employment opportunities in, in Italy. Next, please. In terms of vulnerabilities and risks, the biographical interviews revealed a number of potential vulnerabilities that are linked to the trauma and psychological distress or distressful events that um, these children have experienced. Experiences of torture, sexual violence and exploitation in Libya through the dangerous route across the Mediterranean, but even anger and disappointment at having been pushed back by parents to migrate or be deceived by known individuals. That is often the case, for example, with girls and young women who are victims of trafficking. In general, this lack of or inadequacy of psychological support increases vulnerability because unaddressed trauma prevents them from building and imagining their future. Labor exploitation and abuse in transit countries along the journey, including labor and sexual exploitation, can sometimes play a role in the way in the which young migrants perceive and react to risks of labor and or sexual exploitation to which they may be uh, sadly exposed to even in Italy. And in terms of risks of onward movements, some of the uh, uh, causal factors are the conditions in the reception facilities, as I mentioned earlier, they're very contextual, uh, but particularly first line reception facilities, these can be a driving factor, long waiting times, in the reception facilities, but they're also a major obstacle for applicants awaiting family reunification, which if they hadn't been the case, they would, they would, this would be an option that would guarantee a safe and non-risky movement to, to other countries. Unfortunately, when this, when this happens, the frustration means that many of these unaccompanied children leave the reception system and make their journey through, through, you, through Italy and through to third countries in Europe with all the risks of that um, involves. And next, last, in terms of discrimination. Uh, the research did reveal that there is a widespread positive attitudes of peers and Italian uh, adults as well. Uh, but despite these positive attitudes, there's also evidence of discriminatory or racist behavior by Italian society in school, at work, uh, institutions. Some the possibility of finding work is made harder because of the hostility against them. But unfortunately, discrimination and racism also characterizes the housing market from which migrants seem to be ex increasingly excluded. If we can just, just as concluding remarks, we can close the presentation. Um, just to recap, um, I've mentioned this already, that um, the research has shed light on the multiplicity of factors determining the range of opportunities that unaccompanied ch children can seize when they arrive in Italy and when they on their path to trans transition to adulthood and social inclusion, but also on the range of obstacles that unaccompanied children are faced with in this transition. This means that in this process, they're often at a crossroads and have to choose between one or the other path. And those choices will inevitably shape then the triple transition that I referred to at the start. And that is their capacity to overcome past traumas, their capacity to become an independent adult, and finally to be included in Italian society. Another really key finding emerging from the study is that of a category of persons who do not identify themselves either as a child or as an adult, but who have specific needs, requirements and profiles. And these need to be considered through listening and their direct involvement in the decisions that affect them. This is the starting point, obviously, for the transition process to have any chance of success. 
I finish here and thank you for listening to the presentation. Great, sir. Thank you so much, um, uh, Sarah and Mella, for, for an excellent presentation. Um, and congratulations on uh, what is a very well-deserved reward for, uh, uh, for an important study. Um, I wanted to kick us off with a quick round of specific questions to individual panelists, uh, then move to audience uh, questions. Um, I already see we have a few questions and comments coming in through the chat box. Please, um, as you listen and ideas come up, please feel free to um, uh, add those as well, and, and we'll pick them up as we go forward. Um, let me start with a question uh, to you, Sarah. Your research um, presents what what uh, I think is an excellent example of the successful engagement of children in participatory uh, research. Um, and I think we all know at the same time that meaningful participatory research is something that's easier said than done. Um, to that end, I wondered if you could reflect on some of the challenges you faced in implementing uh, this participatory element of the research, particularly with a cohort of um, unaccompanied uh, minors who are facing such serious vulnerabilities um, uh, as, as you alluded to. And anything that surprised you in that process, perhaps uh, do you have any top pieces of advice for colleagues uh, who wish to meaningfully and ethically engage uh, child and youth migrants in their research in a similar participatory manner? Thanks, Josiah. As you know, we, the, the research was commissioned to the ISMU Foundation, but the participatory approach was something that um, the three agencies uh, had as a priority from, from the very start, from the very moment that we drafted the terms of reference. If it's okay with you, I would let Emanuela answer these questions because she has the real insights, uh, having led the research on the ISMU Foundation side. Um, she is. Of course. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so in a research involving uh, vulnerable migrant minors, the challenges are a lot <laughs> in order to engage them directly in the research process. Um, we choose the pre-research approach because it considers and negotiates the disparity of power uh, between the researcher and the interviewee. So the peer researcher is a, an insider on the research field. And this allow interviewees to feel more comfortable talking about their experiences, their difficulties, also those they are still living during the, the interview, and also their aspirations, for example. But the aspects that mm, to be taken into account to create a good research setting are really many. Um, for example, on, on uh, for example, on the nationality of peer research and, and interviewee. It's important that they come from the same geographic area and also considering the eventual incompatibility between their countries of origin. Another important issue which is needed to consider is gender, for example. It should be the same. And to answer the, other, the second question, an aspect that impressed us very much was the extraordinary capacity of peer researchers to develop interviewer skills in very short time. Examples are the capability to listen and the capability to suspend their judgment to allow to interview to express themselves freely. Um, finally, uh, the advice we can share is, first of all, to consider the potentiality of the peer research approach despite the investment it required in terms of times and resources to support the peer researcher. A second advice is to have trust in the capabilities of these young who have already developed a great deal of experience in their lives in terms of strategies, adaptabilities, and personal resources. And finally, the last advice I can mention is to maintain a high level of attention to methodological rigor with continuous comparison between the interviewers and the research team, regularly discussing the difficulties encountered after each interview and try to find together the best solution. Okay, thanks again. Great, thanks. It's a, a great answer. I'm really pleased that you mentioned um, 
the investment of resources necessary to do participatory research correctly. Um, it's uh, it's something that that um, I'm pleased you didn't shy away from because it is an investment. It is a challenge, but it's worth it in the end for for the richness of uh, the the findings as as this report shows. Um, turning to uh, Giuseppe, I, I wanted to ask you a bit about the uh, the uh, impact of this work. Um, the best of UNICEF re, uh, reviewers really picked up on the studies having been particularly uh, effective in its influence on policy and programming. I think that's an important opportunity for us to um, to learn from. So I wondered if you could speak to what you feel were some of the key reasons for this success in, in influence from the research, uh, and perhaps also if there's anything you would have done differently next time. Thank you, Josiah. Um, let me also... Uh, take the floor to thank on behalf of UNICEF for this award and for this occasion. It's uh, really uh, a pleasure and honor to be here and to be able to uh, interact and explain a bit uh, more extensively uh, some key points. Yes, sure. Um, the survey responds and goes with the natural dynamism of the mother and therefore with the need to keep improving and adjusting the child youth protection system starting with this legal framework. In fact, uh, the cornerstone of the child protection legal framework remains definitely the 1989 UN Convention on the Right of the Child, on which most of the domestic legislation are based. It stipulates rights and fundamental principle on child protection. With regard to Italy, reference was already made, but uh, it's, it, it's good to underline again uh, uh, Law 47, Legge Zampa, which was adopted in 2017. Uh, in such a legal framework, it is possible to find a strict divide between children and adults along the uh, 18 years old threshold. Nonetheless, particularly since uh, 1989, um, the, 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 there have been quite relevant developments. Child and youth protection is a dynamic matter, should be treated as such. Since then, there have been a growing attention to youth, in fact, uh, as defined by United Nations within the range of age between 15 and 24 year old. More recently, among the others, in 2019, the Council of Europe, uh, for example, encouraged member states to improve the legal framework, paying attention and including young refugees in transition to adulthood. Uh, needless to add that these developments concern both refugees and migrants. Uh, along this line, the survey has stressed the importance of paying particular attention, attention to individual development. Uh, to look at transition to adulthood as a process and, and to youth as person with specific needs and vulnerabilities. Needs and vulnerabilities which are not belonging to underage only uh, and which do not end suddenly when a person uh, turns 18. In other words, uh, keeping and making reference also to the title of the survey, there should not be a sudden crossroad but rather a smooth process to adulthood. The survey has stressed and provided evidence corroborating this approach and provided arguments to put it forward. This is uh, a new approach which goes a step beyond child protection. It relies and is based on the full accomplishment of the rights reserved to children by law, but it looks forward. Uh, it assumes a holistic approach. It considers the entire individual and the dynamic process of development. This is also in, in line to, to pick up another fundamental principle um, and is an, an, the natural expression, respect and development on the fundamental principle of the best interest of the child. It finds uh, its full and complete fulfillment in the natural perspective and process to become an adult. A person is to be supported on the entire process leading to their. At the crossroads, uh, contributed to pave the ground and to provide objective evidences and elements to corroborate and support, uh, in fact, the advocacy towards uh, those ends. Uh, the survey 
uh, going to the practical impact was shared with key institution. And these arguments have been brought to the attention of competent authorities involved in the matter. Among others, it was shared with the authorities currently engaged in drawing the national plan for children and adolescents in Italy. Uh, uh, furthermore, um, we as UN agencies, IOM, UNICEF, UNHCR, supported a project proposal exactly uh, submitted by ISMO to the European Commission this is under uh, consideration. And also this is a prospectus uh, taken upon and considered in the child guarantee project. What to do differently? Uh, coming to an end of the answer. Um, obviously there is always uh, room for improvements. Uh, it, it's a quite new, creative and timely initiative though. Uh, we keep on uh, following what has been initiated with it, building on its outcome and recommendation. As I said, um, youth, their engagement and attention to their specific needs require constant and continual commitment. There is still a way to go, as it was mentioned also by colleagues uh, uh, beforehand, and this survey uh, contributed to it. Thank you. Great. No, thanks so much. And um, I think it's it's a real testament to, uh, in practically speaking, the clarity of the writing in this report that you've been able to communicate the nuance of the holistic um, triple transition concept in a way that that expert and non-expert audiences both can can engage with. Um, so uh, I, I think that's that's uh, fantastic and a really important lesson for other researchers to take away from this work. Um, let me ask uh, now Laura, uh, our, our third and, and final question for turning over to uh, the audience. Um, this research uh, also offers a good example of cooperation, uh, interagency cooperation in this case between UNICEF, IOM and UNHCR. Could you connect this research project uh, perhaps with some other initiatives and actions that the three agencies are working on together uh, at the Italian level? Um, and and uh, I, ideally where those initiatives are going, uh, what, where you see the value of that cooperation line. Sure, thanks a lot. And also from my side and from the side of IOM, thanks to UNICEF Innocenti and for all the work that has involved uh, the, the organization of these webinars and of the award in general. Um, and yes, to, to, to answer your question, I think uh, our, the research we are discussing and celebrating today stays within a broader context of cooperation that the three agencies are, are exploring and developing over time at the national and European level. I think we can split, maybe divide into two strands of, of cooperative approaches, let's say, uh, this broad uh, work, joint work. Uh, on one side, we have many actions that require con and activities or topics that require continuous uh, attention and constant attention by the three agencies all together at the national level. For example, while we um, constantly try to participate into uh, tavoli di lavoro, so tables uh, at the policymaker uh, level. Uh, as Giuseppe was mentioning before, uh, to push for a current implementation of legislation with regards of many um, uh, areas of intervention like perception, is assessment, asylum, best interest, determination, etc. Uh, and this is something that is not done one shot, but is uh, continuously done over the years and over the, in the, the, the decades, I would say. Uh, we also have a very good collaboration and, and standing cooperation in terms of uh, the collection and the standardization of data that we are gathering regarding mixed migration in Europe and especially um, on children arriving to Europe, uh, which means uh, trying to harmonize not only what we get from national authorities, but also how we present those data in our public portals uh, and in our public uh, uh, fora and, and, and ways of being uh, the UN uh, to the outside, to the public. Uh, and I think this data collaboration is also the very basics of uh, um, report production at the European level, which um, is the interagency fact sheet on children in Europe, which is again another good example of uh, continuous um, collaboration because it, it started in 2015. And, um, and, and it's 
the result of the, all this cooperative approach and, and collaboration in gathering data because it's, it shows um, data and figures and information on arrivals, reception, asylum, relocation, resettlement, everything that, that concerns children arriving and staying in Europe as migrant or refugees children are accompanied in, in our uh, region. Um, on the other side, we have maybe standalone or punctual interventions, like, like this research uh, is a very good example. And I think uh, our transition to how to report is something, it's like having been very, um, uh, we, we have been anticipating something that is now becoming relevant in many other countries, because the fact of having a growing population of adolescents becoming adults is something that is not only uh, um, is for Italy, but it's for, for many other countries now in Europe. And, 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 and this is demonstrated also by the fact that the European agenda and some European funds are now de uh, designated to and devoted to uh, paying attention to this uh, phase of the of the age uh, and on, of the development of adolescents and the fact that they are becoming adults in our societies. Uh, also, other punctual maybe um, ways of of uh, in intervening and join uh, and being jointly in some col in collaborative work are other pieces of research like the Lumos research on child care arrangements, which also was uh, done in 2019, 2020. Uh, we are trying to, uh, we are collaborating, not trying, we are doing this. We are translating and adapting into the Italian context, the GBV pocket guide of the EASC. Uh, and we are trying to, to, to develop tools, training tools and videos, which would, uh, which are meant to, to no, um, non-specialized work in, in providing first supports to GBV survivors, including children and adolescents in the reception facilities, et cetera. Um, I could mention many other ways in which IOM, UNHCR and UNICEF are collaborating in Italy and at European level. Of course, no one has yet mentioned the COVID pandemic, but of course, in response to COVID and how the three agencies um, try to support national authorities and European authorities in, in granting assistance to the more vulnerable groups. Um, maybe the most visible thing in Europe would be the relocation uh, and the transfer of unaccompanied children from the Aegean islands to other European countries, but there are many. So I think the value of this kind of very broad uh, and, and, um, and differentiated cooperation would be the fact that, that um, of course, we are learning from each other. We are trying to, to, to bring our perspective together to, to be to grow together and also to do advancement in our knowledge uh, and experience on several topics. Uh, and this makes us also um, more visible, more credible and stronger as a UN voice uh, with vis-a-vis uh, -vis the national and local counterparts and in Europe. Uh, and also allows us, uh, thinking about Italy and maybe other European countries, uh, connects the dots. So allows us to uh, help and support national authorities in connecting their own agenda with an international agenda that comes from uh, international fora and the UN um, agendas uh, more in general. So I think there's great value and great ways to, to progress uh, on with this cooperation. But I'm happy to, to reply to any other question. Of Excellent. Thank you, Larry. Um, actually, in the spirit of, of collaboration, um, I'd invite colleagues who are, are listening in to put in the chat or comment box um, relevant uh, initiatives your own organization may be um, uh, uh, undertaking or that you're aware of, which, which speak to some of those synergies that Laura just mentioned. Um, we are... Um, uh, looking at just enough time for, for a couple questions. We've had some, some very interesting ones come through in the uh, uh, chat box just now. I'm going to direct these to um, uh, the panelists who uh, I think is best suited to answer them. But to the other panelists, please feel free to also jump in if you have additional thoughts. Um, let me start with one to, to Sarah and Emanuela. Um, there, uh, we're asked, can you highlight uh, some of the differences on the vulnerabilities and obstacles that face the female group involved in the research? Are there any differences with the male groups? So, so unpacking a bit more about that gender dimension, 
Thank you. Again, I will give this a go, uh, a go. Um, not the subject matter specialist. The, the, obviously, I think it's quite obvious that this type of research is a multi-sectoral research. So we had subject matter specialists on the three UN agency side and on the ISMU side for each of the areas that we, we zoomed into. So in terms of uh, differences with girls and boys, there are definitely some, obviously, um, the, uh, the first more obvious one is the one that many of the girls that come to, to Italy uh, come because they have been trafficked. And uh, so they, they come into Italy and they, uh, there are also cases of girls who um, will uh, not declare that they are a child, that they are under 18 because they um, have been uh, uh, sold to, to a new uh, employment prospects and so have been told that uh, they are to declare that they are an adult um, and of course many of them arrive uh, I think there is evidence abounds this research did not look at um, what happened during the journey our focus was one the social inclusion paths in Italy but there is uh, many many uh, evidence and documentation and reports and data on um, what happens is the traumatic experiences, the violence that uh, these children go through in the journey and particularly in their transition to, to Libya. So when these girls arrive in Italy, there is um, conflict, conflict between them wanting to move on and get over the, the trauma and very extremely, what we found from the research, incredible strength and resilience and agency to, to do that. But on the other hand, uh, a lot of trauma and the difficulty to overcome that when the services are not there uh, and they're not linguistically or culturally mediated. And that type of psychological support is, is really, really fundamental. And also in terms of then their actual inclusion parts, um, there's uh, some differences in terms of there are some at times they are in an overprotected protective environment in the reception facilities and that at times precludes them from seizing some opportunities to move on and acquire that type of autonomy. So that's um, that's uh, there's certainly differences uh, certainly differences there. I don't know if Emanuela or maybe even Giuseppe wants to comment on that, but um, definitely differences there are both in terms of the sample and in terms of the uh, overall population and of unaccompanied children, but also uh, young migrants and, and refugees, they're a very small proportion. There are 10% of the migrant and refugee population of unaccompanied children, but with some very specific needs and some um, very high levels of vulnerability and risk once they arrive in Italy. Great, thank you. Um, Giuseppe Emanuela, did you have any additional comments on that? No. Okay. Um, Giuseppe, I'm gonna ask the next question to you. We, we've actually had two questions here about um, uh, legal pathways. Um, and the first is, what steps have been taken in Italy to fast track procedures related to legal status of unaccompanied migrant and refugee children? Uh, and the second is, can you comment on, on legal aid regarding migration status in cases of labor dispute. Um, so perhaps if, if you have any thoughts on uh, both questions or one of those two. Thank you. Actually, commenting also, Sarah, I fully agree. I don't have anything to add because it was really comprehensive. Uh, regarding the points raised, actually the legislation, which was mentioned uh, during the main presentation, is very advanced and uh, is very sensitive to the needs uh, and, uh, and peculiarities of uh, underage. Um, due to that, uh, uh, a number of safeguards are uh, granted and, uh, and uh, are provided by law. Among them, there is also the priority paths, for example, to international protection. Uh, unaccompanied and separated children as a priority in terms of registration and access to the uh, procedure and interview. Uh, this is uh, one of the example uh, answering to, uh, to the question, what is, uh, what is foreseen uh, as, uh, as procedures? Obviously, um, 
things are still to be improved further. Um, for instance, uh, uh, what happens sometimes is that uh, children have uh, planned to uh, join their relatives in other European country. And uh, when, it, when it comes to that, uh, procedures are still lengthy. And this, uh, uh, this is, uh, depends also to quite a complex procedure to follow uh, and uh, a relation between European countries based on, I don't want to go in details on the uh, regulations, but uh, this is just to give uh, uh, a hint of what, uh, what is happening. So uh, law is very, is very advanced. Uh, in the practice, uh, very often uh, uh, lawyers or other uh, pro uh, professions who need to get involved need to deal a case by case. It's, uh, so just to finish answer, answering how um, no matter how long you spend in, the, in, the, in, in this field, uh, every case is a single one with, which needs to be dealt uh, uh, particularly uh, on, on its uh, own peculiarities. So it's difficult uh, sometimes to give an overall answer, but I try to, uh, to do so and uh, uh, if there is any, any further uh, clarification to be provided, very happy to, to do. Thanks. Excellent. But thank you. Answered that very ably. Um, I'd like to leave the uh, last word to the panelists. Is there anything uh, you'd like to comment on? Anything you would maybe hoped you had been asked that you weren't? Uh, and if not, we can we can uh, bring the conversation to a close. Okay. I'll, I'll take that as as a no. So let me uh, let me just end by saying uh, again uh, a very sincere thanks to the panelists and and to all of you. Um, uh, uh, attending this this webinar, uh, it's obvious we could carry on this conversation much further. Um, I want to echo Kerry's comments at the start uh, that this study really um, uh, represents the kind of evidence based research we need uh, to to improve the wider uh, debate around child migration. And in that regard, it complements well UNICEF's Innocenti's own growing research agenda on child migration, including a flagship study on children on the move in the Horn of Africa that we're just about to launch, and we've uh, also are, are very pleased to announce uh, the, the publication of a special edition uh, of the UNHCR World Bank Joint Displacement uh, Center's Quarterly Digest, which is spotlighting data-driven uh, uh, research on child migration launching this week. Um, with that aside, I, I think that there is uh, a, a number of obvious points here where we need to continue building on the momentum of this research. I think the research ends with some very clear um, calls for further action, and uh, it is it is uh, uh, coming at an ideal time given the urgency of this this critical issue facing uh, unaccompanied minors, uh, migrant children uh, across Italy, across Europe, and, and globally. So um, again, many thanks. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation, and Manu, back over to you to uh, to bring this to a close. Thank you so much, Josiah and panelists, for this great discussion. Uh, just to let you know that you can find more information on this study and the recording of today's webinar on the BURI website and the GDC platform. We have just posted the links in the chat. The next BURI webinar will be on the 7th of April, and it's on ending institutionalization and strengthening family and community-based care for children in Europe. And finally, for the UNICEF colleagues uh, with us today, a reminder that you still have time to apply for the Best of UNICEF Research Award competition in 2021. We accept entries until the 31st of March. And again, the link is in the chat. Uh, to conclude, I would just like to thank all the presenters and the speakers, but also the colleagues who have supported with IT and multimedia. Uh, Celeste Lebovitz, Gerard Cabildo at the New York office, and Claire Akarst, Christina Pizzolato, and George Murphy in Florence. Thank you so much for joining us today and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.